designed to encourage, empower, and educate real estate professionals by sharing best practices from business leaders that are proven winners. I'm your host, Kyle Malnati, and this is Calibrate Real Estate. Two, one. Broadcasting from the Mile High City, thank you for tuning in to the Calibrate Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Malnati, and this is the podcast designed to encourage, empower, and educate real estate professionals, especially business owners. This next episode is going to be a treat. It's a continuation of the real estate conference that we hosted here in Denver for leaders all around the country. And it happens to be a keynote speech by yours truly, myself. We've waited uh, the longest to put this message out there. We decided that we wanted to have all of the other presenters go first. As a host goes, especially when you're hosting a party, the host eats last. And there's a great book actually called Leaders Eat Last. Well, this episode is all about hiring. Do's and don'ts of how you build your team, how you prune your organization. And uh, as a testimonial, what I would like to do is I would like to share an awesome email that we got on this very topic. One of the attendees in the room is the husband of Tara Moore. His name is Matt Moore. Matt is from Florida. His wife, Tara, has been on two of our podcast episodes in the past, and she is a dynamic speaker and a dynamic realtor. I would encourage you to check out those podcast episodes with Tara Moore. Here's the note that Matt Moore sent to me. Kyle, you are the man. I like that. I like the way it's starting, Matt. I appreciate you giving us the book, The Ideal Team Player. And that's a book by Patrick Lencioni, for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, going on with his email, as you obviously know, we are going through the hiring process here shortly. We have a candidate in mind, and the whole time I was reading, I was applying these characteristics to myself and this potential hire. Halfway through the book, I sent a text to Tara saying, we need, in all caps, to hire this guy. I can't say thank you enough for your generosity on handling, handing this book our way. Have a wonderful day. Well, Matt Moore, thank you so much for your kind endorsement. And that's a great segue to anyone who is listening to this podcast. If you provide a review, that's a five-star review on iTunes. Send us an email to info, I-N-F-O at calibrate-R-E.com. And we will send you a free copy of the book, The Ideal Team Player. The rest of this episode is going to go into that book in detail. So if you're kind of skeptical about whether you want to have the book sent or whether you want to send us an email in the first place, go ahead and listen to the rest of this podcast about the hiring process. I've titled it, Who Hates Hiring? And anybody that's made a bad hire hates hiring. <laughs> but I hopefully can teach you how to make a great hire going forward. So for all of the people that are involved in this podcast, most notably, Kayla Davis, our producer, and the cast of a thousand people listening, as well as any of the guests that we've had. My name is Kyle Malnati. I'm your host, and I will see you around the neighborhood. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy this podcast. So let's talk about why I decided to hire. So Matt Ritter, who you saw here, uh, consulted me, as well as a career coach of mine that said, hey, look, you're about to have twins. You and your wife are about to have twins. We went from zero to three in just 16 months. And he said, you're going to need some assistance. You're not going to be able to do this anymore just on sheer brute force. So this is circa 2011 in April. This was the year before I was recognized in Realtor Magazine. And what I didn't realize was two months later, my brother was going to die. And um, so my brother passed away from a congenital heart defect. It was something he was born with. And it was something that we kind of knew might happen, but we certainly didn't expect it, and it rocked my world. Not only did it rock my world, my parents were numb. If you've ever seen someone that has lost someone very close to them, very important to them, they almost go 
gray. And that happened for a couple of years, actually. So my wife and I kind of felt like we took the burden here of, the, of just kind of being the light of the family by having these two wonderful little babies, Amelia and Henry. They were a month old when this picture was taken in April 2011. Charlotte was aged 17 months. We're happy to say that we've got one second grader and two first graders now. So life is fun, and we are... Uh, we are going to start our own parenting Uber service um, because we drive them all over the place. So Matt, my coach Rory, several other people said, you've got to hire someone. And we went back a slide here. Gary Keller, and you hear it from so many other people. What do we do? We're slow to hire, quick to hire. All right, so what the heck does that mean? All I knew is that you had to be really slow about hiring, quick about firing. So... What ends up happening after a couple of years, uh, brother passes away, parents are obviously shocked, your whole family kind of comes in town, congregates, and then up and leaves because they all have to go back to their own lives in their own states. Um, you just start grinding away. And for a while, Rogers was talking about this, my why was living the life my brother didn't have anymore. And so for me, it was about working hard. It was about having an opportunity. He was younger than me. I felt like every single day I had was a blessing where I could bless the world. And it was a life he didn't have anymore. And so what ends up eventually happening is you start hiring some people because all of that work and effort, you start to have some success. And um, so we hired. And uh, I had some assistants. They were great. Um, and then we got to a point where production was really, really good, and we hired someone that was really a driver, and most of what we were trying to do is just drive production. So we had our best year ever. It was 2014, and she had to be fired, terminated. And so this is now coming in the beginning of 2015, and I'm looking at the last couple of years as a failure because while we had great production, we were gonna basically be taking the, the backbone of the support out of our team, but I was, I was completely tired and, and completely burnt out from it. And I was trying to figure out, like, how do we get here? I was feeling overworked, tired, and needing help fast, so I hired fast. I didn't have a process for it, so my new problem now is now that I had the person who had to be fired is that I hated going to work. I actually did not like being there, and now I had to pay someone to leave, which made it even more insulting. So, uh, getting some advice from authors and different people. My buddy Dave Ramsey um, loves to say business is easy until people get involved, right? It's always easy when everything's up here and you're the only person and you're the solo agent, right? But you start bringing people on board, you start hiring people, and all, at, at some level, all of us, that's that hot, sweaty day Rogers talked about. Uh, we, we start to think, you know, why can't I find someone or why can't we find someone that thinks and works like us? Well, it doesn't work like that. As the leader, you're supposed to bring people along. And uh, my career coach, Rory Vaden, best-selling author from Nashville, Tennessee, of Take the Stairs, several people in this room have read that book, reminded me that the emotional energy of making a decision is greater than the physical energy of executing that decision. Now, that works on both sides. That works on the side of having to let someone go. That emotional energy, that buildup, and that gap between the emotional energy of deciding you're going to do something and the physical of actually doing it is going to be that burnout phase. If you know that you've got to do something and you're delaying it until all of a sudden you have to. And so Rory reminded me that. And so the next step was, okay, what the heck did I do wrong? And um, you may have felt this way at one time. And so what I'm trying to figure out is, okay, why did this happen? Why did I hire someone that was very, very talented, had great experience, had great skills, but was miserable to work with? Maybe it was me. And what I'd come to find out, and you've had a chance to interact with my staff today and my team, the brokers that are, that are in our company, is that we no longer hire for experience, skills, or ability alone. Um, two of the strongest admin folks on my team didn't know a lick about real estate before they started working with us. Uh, one came uh, right out of college and was trying to find themselves working in a pizza parlor and just really didn't want to kind of go to a real job. The other was, was working in a salon. And so what we found is that we hire for organizational fit. Now, this isn't new. Jim Collins talks about this in Good to Great, right? It's finding the right person to fill the right seat on your bus. This is someone who fits me, who fits our team for this time that we're working with. And I'm not building an all-star team. I'm actually trying to build a championship team. And all championship teams have great role players, right? So that doesn't mean that you can't have all-stars, but you've got to have some role players, some grinders, some utility players sprinkled in the mix. 
So Dave Linegar from Remax International, based here in Denver, on Brian Buffini's podcast about a year ago, had shared that Remax is not a family. A family actually tolerates members that aren't pulling their weight, that get drunk at Christmas parties, and everybody excuses their behavior, is basically what he was talking about. A team wins together. Further, a guy that maybe a lot of you don't know, Reed Hastings, says that we model our see, uh, ourselves on being a team, not a family. A family is about unconditional love. A dream team is about pushing yourself to be the best teammate you can be, caring intensely about your teammates, and knowing that you may not be on the team forever. That's a good teammate. So how do we hire slowly? We already know how to fire quickly, if, if, you, if you can. But Reed Hastings from Netflix is reminding us that we're not a family. So it sounds almost utopian, very kumbaya. Now give me a plan, right? So um, we developed this plan after distilling a lot of information from books and authors, but then also just going through the process several times and getting all the way to the finish line and deciding it just doesn't feel right. So the interview process is what we're going to drill really deep in, and here's the plan for you. So we're going to add more steps, not to complicate your life, but to intentionally make the candidate earn their position on your team. This is a special opportunity. And if you make it feel too easy, if you do what I did and hire after one interview, after 30 minutes, where you're looking at the resume and asking questions about the resume, it is going to end up miserable for you. So what we did is we add more steps. First step, the announcement. You've got to get excited about your own position that you're offering. This is an exciting opportunity. And I will tell you, when you've just fired someone and you're feeling like we just reduced from our team, it's really difficult to get excited about it, right? So sometimes you've got to have that mental pep top. Sometimes you've got to have a coach that's telling you this is an exciting opportunity. So we're doing that through social media. We're doing that on our website. We're sharing it around. We'll send it to our email list and actually ask our clients for referrals. And what we do is we create a career description when we're doing that announcement. I don't like to call it a job description anymore because I'm hiring someone for a career. I'm hiring for some, someone for a career in real estate where we're going to teach them tools. And here are some, our, some of our actual career descriptions. We don't want someone looking for a J-O-B. Someone will just punch a clock and give the bare minimum to get a paycheck. Those who love silos, we operate in a team environment and collaborate on a daily basis. If you want to work by yourself, go play solitaire. Real career description. Our goal is to help position each team member in a role that plays to their strengths, that helps them to shine, to win, know yourself well enough to know what you do well and just importantly what you don't. We're not here to hire you to do something that you don't do well. Because one of the things that I look at is I'm hiring people that are good at one or two things that I don't really like, but then are also good at one or two things that I'm sort of marginally good at, right? So that I can help multiply the things and take the things that I'm not really gifted at. And then have a life. You know, last night was a really rare circumstance for my team, but we don't work a lot of past eight-hour days. Now, I do at times, and as a leader, I feel like that's leading by example when something has to get done. But we actually put this in our career descriptions. We work very few late nights at, after eight hours. All right, so here's the next one. And we want this job description, career description, to fit the position. So are you naturally super organized and enjoy helping others? Do you, it's, do you start designing your Christmas cards around Halloween and smile at the opportunity to, to update your friends' addresses? I hate that, by the way. My wife loves it. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to hire someone that was very similar to my wife. And so I was actually creating this emotion around what is it that my wife really does well to organize our family? Do you get, get excited when Shredathon Day is announced? I hate that also because I like everything in a box so I don't have to deal with it. Um, <laughs> and I hate getting rid of things. Did you look forward to buying school supplies in August when you were a kid? If not, then you don't need to apply. Another sample career description. In so many ways, it's like no place you've ever worked. As our marketing coordinator, you must be one of the most colorful people in our organization, passionate about real estate marketing, and a leader that our team will trust. You must be able to inspire and influence those around you. The most important thing is you must be a cultural fit. We don't hire just to fill a seat. We take our time looking for the right people. Our interview process is probably more involved and thorough than you used to, but the good news is you don't have to have 25 years of experience on Madison Avenue. We're looking to hire someone who can hit the ground running in these areas of key responsibilities. So we define it right in, in that career description, online, before they ever interact with us. This is going to take T-I-M-E time. Can you crunch numbers backward and forward off the top of your head? Were you the first person, or were you the one person in your math class that loved dividing fractions and solving word problems? We're hiring for an analyst here. So as you get the point here, 
we're looking for the ideal team player. And we have a model for this. Hungry, humble, and smart as a trip over that. All right, so there's a lot of discussion about funnels, especially in marketing. And so the, the way we were talking about this as a team as I was about to present this is we're pouring candidates into a funnel. And at each stage, it represents an opportunity to prune, to reduce out of the candidate pool. We want to take as many steps as we can before someone walks in the door and waste their time wasting our time, right? So what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can to cull them out before they actually meet with us. So these multiple touch points using different communication mediums provides a filter. We start online, and then we start with the phone, and then we start with face-to-face. -face. I used to do it completely missing those other steps. I used to just go right face-to-face, -face. you send me your resume, you've got a pulse, you must deserve to be hired, right? You must deserve to be in that interview process, so we stop that. So the first thing that we do, and this is my favorite part of the entire presentation, and I'm gonna go slow on this part and fast through the rest of it. So we ask every single person that submits a resume to stop and for the next day or two, ponder answering these eight questions. Is it eight? Is it seven? It's seven. Um, these seven questions. Why are you interested in this position? We want to figure out what their purpose is. What are your two greatest life accomplishments? What would you consider to be your biggest weakness? So that's one that gets asked a lot, but we want to see if they slip up and tell us something that really we don't want to hire them for. What's your greatest obstacle that you've successfully overcome within the past year? Every person that I have hired to be on our team, whether it's a broker or an admin, has had adversity in their life, and they're willing to talk about it, and they're willing to use that to overcome. And that's, that's one of the most important questions that I like to hear an answer to. And this is all in writing. Most of what we do is through email. Most of what we do is through text message. If you can't communicate well through writing, I don't want to meet you in person. So it's just a step. What are the top three things that motivate you? Who are the two important influences in your life? What salary do you expect in this position? We don't post a salary for our hires anymore. We used to, and what ended up happening is people would create this either expectation that they could get us to get convinced, basically, that they could make more, or they would lie to us. And so basically what we do is we force their hand and say, what do you think you can and should make? And what happens a lot is we'll be hiring for a position that someone wants double, and maybe they're capable, maybe they have the right to ask for double, but we just send them a nice email back saying, hey, look, it sounds like you're probably way overqualified for this position. We really appreciate it, but we don't think it makes sense to take you into the next level. This is the best question that we have added to our interview process. It self-selects so many people out, and the best part is when we send that email to them and they send back saying, well, I, you know, I'm really just bothered by the fact that this took me time and I submitted my resume, and what a big waste of time. We know this was a very good question, and it happens a lot. People get real snarky by email. We've had several situations where that happens. And we're like, well, you know, it was a good question to ask. So phone interview. Each of our team members develops these questions. Here are some examples of questions. And what I found is that in the hiring process, very few people actually talk about what questions to ask in interviews. I've been interviewing for the last four years as a function of a podcast. And so we like to drum up these questions that are going to end up either answering issues that we've actually had on our team in the past and we're trying to find basically the door that someone walked through when crazy walked into our building. Um, but the other part of this too is if it's going to be specific for the job description, we want to make sure that they've got a really good plan on how they stay organized, how they keep their calendar, describing their leadership experience, etc. So the big key here is we have team number one, team member number one do the first interview. They give us a very detailed description of who they like, and their role is to reduce the candidate pool from 30 or 40 applicants. They're gonna take, we're gonna take all this as a team as they do that written interview, take it down to 10 or 15 people. They're then supposed to take that group down to five people. So before anybody walks through the door, we're trying to do everything we can to take that funnel, whittle it all the way down. So second interview, is the next team member, and then they're gonna compare notes on the different people, and, and the whole point is, we've all had a couple of different people, whether it's an interview, or a date, or just a friend where it takes two or three different interactions before all of a sudden you figure out that they're nuts, right? Everybody's got a crazy friend, and sometimes what happens is they're good at disguising it. So then on-site interview, 30 minutes max, what's your learning style, type of, 
work environment that you thrive in? How do you handle stress? How do you relieve stress? What are you expecting of us? And we're writing these, these answers down because what we're doing is we're basically creating a script for if they get hired, what we want them to be, um, what, we, what we need to be thinking about as we bring this person in because every single one of us is gonna get stressed. Everyone's gonna have a pet peeve. Anna developed that one and I love that question because everyone has a pet peeve. You spend enough time in a small enough office, you're gonna get annoyed with each other and we wanna know what that is real quickly. And then what was your worst environment? What was your best environment? All right, second on-site interview. Um, they're gonna actually take an assessment tool. We use DISC, uh, pretty common for a lot of people, but it's very easy to work through. It's 28 questions, so don't put too much credence into it. But we're again hiring for fit. Now we're gonna over, over, do an overview of the role of our key results area. So that is that career description that we posted online put into an actual one-page action plan that if we were gone for three weeks, what are you supposed to do every day? And what this does is it sets up an expectation. It sets an expectation for us, we're reminding ourselves of why we're hiring this person. So going through that effort before they actually get there is very important. The second part of it is it's going to create some continuity and consistency with what we had online, right? So they're seeing that we mean it. What ended up happening is I like to communicate so much, I like to talk, and what ends up, what ends up occurring is I start just selling the organization. I think we're great, I think we're really cool, and I start talking about how great we are. If I don't have that piece of paper to talk about what you're supposed to do every day, all of a sudden, I get off track. So the KRA is important. Then we describe the ideal team player. So this is actually a book that came out two years ago. That, uh, that talks about this Venn diagram here, humble, hungry, and smart. Um, we now have a candidate fill out a budget. And again, going back to that hiring question where we ask people what salary they expect, we have found that people will ignore what salary they need to make just because they, they think that the job is a great opportunity. And they think that if they do well enough in six months, they can make more. And so what we do is we actually have them sit down and fill out a budget. And what happens is if they fill out a budget and all of a sudden there's no alignment on what we're supposed to be giving them in the way of a salary, they're selected out of the process again. So this stage unlocks the next stage. Each team member compares notes from the written interviews, from the phone interviews, and now from the in-person interviews. Again, we're hiring for fit, not experience alone. Humble, hungry, and smart. Patrick Lencioni had the, the blessing of being able to speak see him speak in Dallas, and he says, ideal team players work with a sense of energy, passion, personal responsibility, taking on whatever they possibly can for the good of the team. And we all know who these people were, especially if you actually played sports. You know that ideal team player, right? So I'm gonna breeze through these really quickly because it's all in a book. Um, humble people lack excessive e ego or concerns about status. Hungry people almost never have to be pushed to work harder because they're self-motivated and di diligent. They're always looking for more. Smart people, this is common sense smarts. This isn't intellect. Um, and so they have good judgment and intuition. And so we're looking for that person that's got that perfect intersection of all three. Now we get to a group interview. This is gonna take a lot longer. They're gonna see us interact as a group. We're using a round table or panel approach. Oops, sorry. I didn't wanna uh, get too far ahead of myself. Each member has to participate, so each member that's gonna sit there has to bring a question with them, and we're gonna rehearse this beforehand as well. So ideally, the group consists of a, a wide variety of occupational, organizational positions, administrative, executive, sales, et cetera. Now, if you don't have a big team, this can be harder, but the whole idea is that people typically communicate with your receptionist differently than they do with the CEO, differently than they do with the sales guy, differently than they do with the guy that's been there for three months versus 30 years. So what we wanna do is we wanna make sure we see how they interact with everybody, and we're trying to find holes in their game. The spousal interview, this is something that I picked up from Dave Ramsey, and it's phenomenal, and we really do it. So their spouse or significant other has to attend. If they won't, we won't hire them. Because here's the thing, we all take baggage home with us from work every single day to our houses. That person is going to learn a lot, that spouse or that significant other is gonna learn a lot about what we're doing on a daily basis. So we wanna kind of figure who they are. And like I said earlier in one of my presentations, I married up, and so a lot of times my spouse makes me look a heck of a lot better than I do in person. So the key is now my spouse has to be there because I bring a lot of stuff home. And I talk a lot about our team and our organization. And so if I'm talking constantly about someone who's a problem that she's never met, 
all of a sudden things blow out of control. But if she's met them, she's had a chance to interact with them. And here's the thing. Courtney's got this radar. She's got this intuition that I miss. And the blessing of marrying your best friend, marrying the person that you know completes you. And I know it sounds cheesy, Jerry Maguire stuff here, but they have an opportunity to see the world in a different way than you do. And so if you miss on this opportunity to hire someone so important for your team and you're not bringing your spouse with you, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's really been a game changer for us. Now we wait until the very, very end to do that. This is after several steps here. And here's an actual picture of Connor, his wife Tessa, Courtney, and myself. And this is biblical. Who can find a, find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies? The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so, she, so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. That's Proverbs. King Solomon wrote that to his kids, Proverbs 31, 10 through 12. So for me, this is something that I'm making sure that my wife understands and accepts who these people are. We had one guy, it was great, he was being hired for an analyst position. He was just blowing through the entire process. We had been looking for an analyst for over a year. We felt like, gosh, this was great. He was a recommendation. And we have the spousal interview. He doesn't have a significant other. He's coming from college, so we're like, okay, no big deal. And um, we're like, all right, we're going to meet here. I sent him a text message with the address. He's kind of new to town, so I just was overly thorough with him. Let's meet at Panera. Here's the address. Here we go. So the interview comes. It's 1.30. My wife and I are kind of like, okay, where is the guy? I know what he looks like. And I've been talking the whole time to her about him. And I call him. And he's like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, where are you? And he goes, well, I'm at Panera. And I go, okay, which Panera? And he goes, what do you mean, which Panera? And I'm like, well, there's a lot of them. And I sent you a text message with the address and, like, I think I even linked the location, like just put it in a text message. And he goes, oh man. So he drives down, we still have the interview and that just stuck with me. It felt like, gosh, this is weird. I'm talking to Courtney about it and she goes, look, you're hiring this guy to be an analyst and he can't get the right Panera. And if he doesn't know the right Panera, he can't ask you a question. He's a nice guy. He actually got referred and hired by another company that we work with and I've seen him since and it, I think it was one of the best things that we did to not hire that person through the spousal interview. So the ideal team player, now you guys are all going to get a copy of the book today as a gift. So you guys are all getting a copy of this. My staff will end up passing it around. So what is someone when they're humble only? They're a pawn. They're a pushover. We're never hiring someone that's only humble. The hungry only person is a bulldozer, determined to get things done with a focus on their own interests. The charmer, Ferris Bueller, right? Uh, They're smart only, so they can be entertaining, even likable, but have interest in the long, uh, but have little interest in the long-term well-being. The accidental mess maker. So this is my daughter, Charlotte. Humble and hungry. And this is probably one of the most excusable situations. You can actually train up someone to be a little bit more people smart. But this is one of those things. It's the wagging dog. It's the puppy that's got to be wrapped on the nose with the newspaper. You know, hey, we respect your work ethic and your desire to be helpful, but you're making messes constantly within our organization. The lovable slacker, right? They're humble and smart. They never quite ring the excellence bell, right? Skillful politician, Mayor Joe Quimby, drinking it up with Homer Simpson. Cleverly ambitious and willing to work. This is the most dangerous person you can bring into your organization. They are hungry and they are smart. They are not humble. They're not looking out for you. They're looking out for themselves. All right, so what do you do now? Once you get through that whole process and you found the ideal team player, this is Sam. After you've exhausted all resources, you can feel confident as you press the launch button. So this is kind of cool. On the back wall there, go back one section. So that costs about eight bucks to order at Vistaprint. When we bring new team members on now, we get the Calibrate logo on there. We say, welcome, we're happy to see you. We personalize it, we hang it over their desk. Low tech version, we used to do this. This is Connor kicking his feet up. We just used to write a big old card on a poster board just saying, hey, welcome. We wanted to make sure your desk is set up all right. But it isn't time to put your feet up. It's time to get to work. If you thought the hiring process was detailed, the first 90 days is even more intense. We actually put our new team members on a 90-day probation period. Very low commitment to us, very low commitment to them. They can walk in at any time and say, this doesn't work for me, vice versa. So thank you, everybody. Have a nice night.